Hi, everybody. It's time for the hour for second and third graders here at home at a with APS. I'm Jamie Jacobson, and I have with me today a very special guest that I'm going to introduce to you in just one second. Before we get going, though, I want to give a shout out to all of the boys and girls who attend Shemisa Elementary School in Albuquerque in Learning Zone 3. Um, their principal, Michelle Mansfield, has uh, put out a challenge to each of you to be reading while we're on school closure. She went so far as to even send me a picture of herself reading to her dogs. Uh, she's reading The Giving Tree to Harley and Gus. And if you take a look at that picture, Harley and Gus are loving this book. So in challenge from um, Ms. Mansfield, it's real important that you find time to read each day while you are on home closure. So let's get started with our day. And I want to introduce to you our very special guest. This is Dr. Gabriella Durand-Blakey, and she is the Associate Superintendent for Learning Zone 1 here in Albuquerque. Thanks for coming, Dr. Blakey. Hi, thanks for having me. We are excited to have you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do as, superintend as Associate Superintendent and what is Learning Zone 1 for those kids who are not from Albuquerque who might be watching? Sure, so Learning Zone 1 is an area of about 40 schools. And um, I kind of tell everybody that I'm the principal of the principals. <laughs> so I work with all of the principals um, of schools that are um, basically from our East Mountains um, all the way to downtown Albuquerque. Um, so any students who go to Manzano, Highland, Albuquerque High, or any of the elementary middle schools, um, I serve all of those students. And then all the elementaries that feed into the mm -hmm. middles, those are all part of your, yep. of your group. Now about how many kids do you think you have in Learning Zone so 1? So in Learning Zone 1, we have about 22,000 students. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the kids know they're at home, and I think they know their teachers are, are at home right now. What are the principals doing? So the principals um, go check on the schools every day, uh, making sure that everything is looking good um, and uh, checking for anything that, you know, packages still come during this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, and so they check up on their school, and then every day um, we meet with the principals, much like this. Mm -hmm. We do it um, virtually. Mm -hmm. So every day uh, we have a meeting with all of the principals to kind of give them updates and find out all the fun things that are happening. That's great. And then some of those schools in all the zones are doing the grab-and-go lunches, right? Yeah, so we have a lot of grab-and-go lunches. In Learning Zone 1, um, I think we have about um, half of the schools wow. in the zone are grab-and-go. So um, every day around this time, we go out there, um, say hi to students, give them their food. Um, it's always great to see smiling faces come by and yeah. pick up their food. We give um, packets, and some schools have books that they're handing out. And things That's like great. That. Well, we've really missed the kids here because we're kind of isolated in the studio, so we don't get to see them. Pretty soon, we're going to be working on a way for them to share some of the tasks that we've been working on here via a Twitter handle that we're going to send out when these shows air in April. And so kids, you be saving the work that you're doing because we're going to be able to show your work and share that with all the other students around New Mexico who are watching these shows. So you're going to read a book to us. What's yes. the book you're going to read today? So I am going to read this book um, that is called I Am Enough, and it is by Grace Byers. Okay, I'm going to step off the stage and let you get started, and um, thanks for coming. Great, thank you. All right. So the book for today that I would like to share with you all is I Am Enough by Grace Byers. Um, the pictures are from Keturah Bobo, and it is um, published by Baltzer and Bray. And so let's see what's in this book for today. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. Like the trees, I'm here to grow. Like the mountains, here to stand. Like time, I'm here to be and be everything I can. Like the champ, I'm here to fight. Like the heart, I am here to love. Like the wind, I'm here to push. Like a rope, I'm here to pull. Like the rain, I'm here to pour and drip and fall until I'm full. Like the moon, I'm here to dream. 
like the student here to learn. Like the water here to swell, like the fire here to burn, like the winner, I'm here to win, and if I don't, get up again. I know that I may sometimes cry, but even then, I'm here to try. I'm not meant to be like you, and you're not meant to be like me. Sometimes we will get along, and sometimes we will disagree. I know that we don't look the same, our skin, our eyes, our hair, our frame. But that does not dictate our worth. We both have places here on earth. And in the end, we are right here to live a life of love, not fear. To help each other when it's tough, to say together, I am enough. So I really like this book because I think that we all feel that way and we want to be able to be ourselves yet love each other. And in this time of working at home and doing school from at home, it's teaching us all that we're all different yet we all care about each other and that's why I picked this book. Hi, I'm Mrs. B, and we're going to talk science. Today, we're going to focus on property and purpose. So I have this thing here. Do you know what it is? In science, we make observations using our five senses. So let's review what the five senses are. We can see what's around us. What's around you right now? We can touch what's around us also. What's around you that you can touch? We can also taste, but we need to be careful about tasting. Let's make sure it's something we should be tasting. We can also smell. Is there anything you smell around you right now? And we can also hear. What do you hear around you? So out of my five senses, I'm going to use seeing, touching. I'm not going to taste this. I'll take a quick smell, but I don't smell anything. And I don't think this makes any sound with me just holding it. But if I hit it against the table, I do hear some things, but I'm really not going to use my hearing for this. So let me use my sense of touch and my sense of sight to start to describe this. And maybe we can figure out what it is if you don't already know. So. Some of its properties. So a property is a part of the way something is. And we can observe properties. We can observe its color. I see that it is black, maybe dark gray. Another one of its properties is its shape. So it's kind of shaped like a long S, maybe. It has a circle at the top or a hole at the top. It has some um, things I can look through. Hopefully you can see that. It has some spaces here. It's pretty thick. It's hard. It's not soft. It's smooth. And it's not flexible. Do you know what this is? It's a masher. And one of the verbs used earlier today was mash. So this masher lets you take, for example, a pot of, tom of tomatoes, potatoes, or beans. And then you push down, 
and you squish and mash all of the food in there. And then you get mashed potatoes, refried beans, maybe if you're making a tomato sauce for your spaghetti. So this is a masher. Do we see now why they, it has holes in here? It's so that some of the food goes through and some of the food won't go through. It'll get mashed. So let's look at some other items and talk about their properties and their purpose. And the purpose is the reason something is made. So let's explore some things together. So I have some eating utensils here. Pretty common. Spoon. So a knife and a fork. So let's start with the property color. What color are these plastic utensils? White. And we can tell that they're plastic, so that's another one of its properties or material that it's made out of. What else? Let's look at each one. So the spoon is a little bit flexible, firmer in the middle. It dips in here. Its properties help us eat soup or dig in. Maybe you use it to dig outside. Scooping. A fork, also plastic, is a little bendable. It has prongs. It's sharper than the spoon so that we can grab food. We can also scoop, just like with the spoon. And then our knife. Our knife, also made of plastic, is flexible. It has little teeth or ridges here. They're sort of sharp in order to cut. All of these things we can use to eat with or to create and build with also. What about this? Rubber band. So it's brown. It can stretch. Why is it important that the rubber band can stretch? So that we can put it around things to hold. And maybe we have different sizes. Oh, maybe we shoot it by accident. How about this? Do you know what this is called? A spork. It's a fork and a spoon joined together. So somebody thought, you know, I wish I didn't have to use two utensils. I wish I could just travel with one, or I wish I just had one. I wonder if the inventor of the spork first taped these together and tried them out. So this particular spork is green. I'd say maybe like a lime green. It's pretty flexible. Again, the spoon is rounded. We can scoop with it. The fork, actually, this is a three-in-one now that I look closer. It's a fork. It has prongs, and they're pretty sharp. It also has this edge here, and it also has sharp teeth. So this actually is a spoon with a fork with a knife. All of these three utensils, which somebody thought, you know, how can I make this better? Turned it into one utensil. That's pretty cool. How about this? This is a reusable straw. So I don't throw these away. I wash them and I use them again and again. So this straw is green. It's somewhat flexible, but it's pretty firm. It's smooth. And then at the bottom here, or the top, it has this additional piece of material. Hopefully you can see that. Why would it have that? What's the purpose of that? So if I put it in a cup and I have a lid on the cup and if I don't want my straw to fall out, it has this extra little piece here to stop it so it'll stay in my cup. Pretty cool. I know that the disposable straws don't have that so that's pretty cool so I don't lose my straw. There's a purpose for having that piece there. 
How about this? What is this? Well, this is part of a chopstick set. So let's see. What color would you describe this as? Mm, maybe brown? It has a design at the top, maybe the, and it has some grooves here. And maybe the purpose of that is to hold it better. I usually hold my chopsticks a little lower. Notice its shape. So it's thicker on the top, and then it narrows down. It gets thinner towards the bottom. It's not very sharp. It's pretty flat at the bottom. And so if I had a, another chopstick, I could use them together to grab my food. I might not be able to stab my food necessarily, and maybe that's not what this is intended for. And it's also smooth in the middle. Next up, have you ever used these maybe at school or to make crafts? Pipe cleaners. So I'm thinking from the name itself, it was maybe first made to clean pipes. You could put them in the pipe and twist it and clean it out. So let's see. When I touch this, it's a little sharp. It's shiny, silver. It has wire. I can shape it into things. So this could be used for a lot of fun activities. Next up, do you know what this is? It's a paint palette, and it's a small one. And so it has grooves here where you could keep your paint. It's circular, easier to hold than if it was in a different shape maybe. It's white, it's made of plastic. It's pretty flexible. It has a center here that also has a, a deep groove maybe for mixing paints. So as you notice, all of these things have a certain property that helps it with its purpose. So we want to keep that in mind, right? Would we want a floppy chopstick? No, if it was kind of like a spaghetti noodle, we wouldn't be able to get our food. So we need to make sure that the properties help the purpose. So let's draw a picture together of one of the items here. I'm going to choose the spork. And I want to make sure that we capture all of its properties. Let me go to the board here. I'm going to call it a spork, even though it has a little piece for a knife here. Spork, S from spoon, oh, SP actually from spoon, and then ORK from fork. Two words combined, spoon and fork. Okay, I'm going to do my best to draw this. So it has kind of these sharp pieces here. And it has this jagged piece right there, like a knife. And then it curves down, it's thinner in the middle. And then it opens up again. And I'm going to put a, a shadow, a groove here. Hopefully that lets you know that it's dipped in, that you could see that it has a groove here. So let me list some of its properties. So my spork is green. My spork is flexible. It's also smooth. It has a sharp end. It has a groove, or what would we call this? Concave, meaning we can pick something up with it. 
That's a big word, concave. Dips in like this. What's its purpose? Well, its main purpose is for eating, but we can get creative. Maybe we dig with it. What else can we do with this? I'll leave that up to you to come up with other purposes for this spoon. But primarily, or spork, I'm sorry, but primarily it's for eating. So now it's your turn. Why don't you draw something around you and name its properties and its purpose? So what's a part of it? Think of the color, the texture, if it's flexible, if it's smooth, if it's hard, or if it's rough. And then think about how those properties help with its purpose, what it's made for. And once you drew, draw that, I want you to draw another picture. And this time, imagine how you can make that thing different, new, or better. Like this example, where someone noticed that these three could be combined to form one. So look around you. Use your five senses. What are those again? Look around you. Touch some objects and see if you get ideas. Maybe you can use your sense of hearing or smell to help you. Again, be careful about tasting. And then ask lots of questions. So for example, if we started with these three utensils, what's a how question that we could have had for it? How can we combine these three into one? Why? Why does a utensil need to be flexible? When? When is it better to use a spork than to use three different utensils? What if? What if? the spork I wanted to make was blue or pink or came in a lot of different colors. What will you think of to improve and make better and change its purpose or keep the purpose? These three kept their purpose in one. So maybe whatever you are going to draw, you're going to change its purpose or improve its purpose. Another thing I was thinking about the other day, and I don't have one with me, but I was thinking about a bowl. And what if that bowl could collapse? Have you ever seen those? I've only seen one once, but I think that's a really cool idea. Because if you had a bowl that collapsed, you could take it with you, you could take it places, when we're able to go camping again, or maybe if you and a grown-up go to the park. I think it would be really cool to have those. I've even seen people sometimes have those for their pets because they could put them in their backpacks, and then when they go for walks, they can bring that bowl up, fill it with a little bit of water, their pet can get some water, their dog, and then they can collapse it when they're done. So I challenge you to use your five senses to look around you to see if you notice how you can make something different, change its purpose based on its properties, or how you can make it better. Next up is Mrs. Sears with number of the day. See you next time. Hello and welcome mathematicians to our exploration of a number today. I am Mrs. Sears and I am so excited to be on this journey with you in exploring this number. 
Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the number of the day. But before I do, I wanted to check and see, have any of you done this number of the day routine in your classrooms before? Ah, I thought you might have. That's definitely a fun routine I enjoyed doing when I was in the classroom. So the number of the day that we're going to be working on is 258. That number has a lot of wonderful characteristics about it, and we're going to explore some of them today. So the first thing that I would like to do is talk about this chart that I have behind me. This chart is separated into place value. What do you notice about this chart? I'm going to have you take a couple of seconds before you look at this chart and think about what it is that this chart has on it. One thing that I also want to mention before we go ahead and get started is that you will need a sheet of paper and a pencil if you have one at home because I would like you to record this in your mathematics journal. I'll give you a few seconds to get that and if you need any assistance, please make sure that you ask a grown-up for that information. All right, so what I would like to do is just let's talk a little bit about this place value chart that I did. So a place value chart basically just organizes the digits of our number into their correct place value. I noticed something about this chart. The first thing that I noticed was that it has three letters across the top. I wonder what those three letters mean. Do any of you know what those letters might mean? Well, I thought you would know. What did you think over there on the right? Oh, you said the H, the H would stand for hundreds? You are absolutely correct. Good job. That is true. The H does stand for hundreds. What about our T? Oh, yeah, that T stands for tens. Good job. You did an excellent job in knowing that that T stood for the tens. What about that O? Is it O? No, we have another number? No, that O stands for ones. So now we're going to go ahead and run through the number of the day, and we're going to sort it into its correct place value. Now, if you've forgotten, the number of the day is 258. So if we were thinking of that number, 258, could you count 258 things at your house? Possibly. I know that I have counted 258 things in my house. Sometimes when I'm eating my bowl of cereal, I may check and see how many Cheerios that I have, and that could be 258 in my bowl. What other things could you count at home that might be 258 things? I bet you're thinking, hmm, maybe I could go outside and possibly look at the clouds or find some rocks or just look around at possibly some trees or neighborhoods or different things that it might be around. And that could be 258 things that I could count. Would you be willing to go out and count 258 things? That seems like a huge number. But let's go ahead and put our number of the day into its correct places. So let's see. Hundreds. When I say the number 258, what do you hear when I say 200? How many of those are there? If you said two, you're absolutely correct. Those of you who have drawn this into your math 
journal in our place value chart, would you go ahead and put your two in the hundreds column? So that shows us that we have two hundreds in 258. Now, if I was thinking about the next number that came when I say 258, that would be the 50 part. And even though we say there is 50 of something, we have to say, how many tens is that? So if I was going to count by tens how many 50 is, let me see if I can do that on my hands. I have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So I have five tens in that 50. Now we want to make sure that we again place that five for five tens or 50 into that tens column. Are you keeping track so far? I know you were. You're doing such a great job and I love that you're paying such good attention to your place value chart. Now the last thing that we're thinking of, we had the number 258. We are missing one other digit that we need to go ahead and find its place for. If you were thinking it was the eight, you were absolutely correct. That eight has to go somewhere. And the only column that we have left is our ones. So we must have eight ones that are going to be part of our number of the day, which is 258. So let's recap. We want to make sure in your place value chart that you have in your math journal that you have written our number of the day, 258, in its place value where we have two hundreds, 50 or five tens, and eight ones. That is our number of the day. Now we have a couple of other characteristics that we have that we're going to be thinking of. And we want to know, is this number odd or is it even? Let's think about that for a minute. How would I know if that number was odd or even? Maybe you thought, I should go ahead and look at the last number in our number, uh, in our place value chart, which is referenced with our ones. That number was an eight. Is that eight an odd or an even number? Well, if I'm counting by twos and I went two, four, six, eight, I know things that have twos would also have those even numbers. So maybe it is. It's an even number. So I want to make sure when I'm in there that I would circle the even number. If you could go ahead and write even in your journal and then circle it, that would indicate that you know that our number of the day is also an even number. I have a couple of other characteristics that I want to go through with you as well today. The next one is we have to figure out, can we do 10 more from this number? I think we can. What do you think the 10 more would be from this number? Well, you guys were thinking correct. We probably are going to have to do something to this tens column. Since we said there were five tens, we need to think of what would one more 10 be that would go with that number to make it 10 more than 258? If you said we changed that 5 to a 6, you were correct. That new number that is 10 more would be 268. I'm going to say that correctly because I always want to make sure that we don't put an and in there. So it really is 268. Okay? Again, we're going to be looking at what would be 10 less? Well, if you guessed before 
that that five had to change in the tens column, you are correct. And that we went ahead and did one number up from five in placing that six in the tens place, that made it 60. We now need to think about what would 10 less than that 50 be? Well, if we're counting again by tens and we did 10, 20, 30, 40, that was one less than that 50 that we had in the first place. So if we're thinking about our number that is 10 less than 258, it would be 248. I want to give you guys some time to make sure that you have captured this in your journal so far. Remember, we have placed the numbers in the place value chart as correct. The 2 in the 200s, the 5 in the 10s, and the 8 in the 1s in the column. We also figured out that it was even as a number, and so far we have done 10 more than that number and 10 less. Our next characteristic that we're going to be working with is the hundreds. I wonder which column we're going to be using this time. Any thoughts? Oh, you guys have it so correct over there in the red. You know that it is going to be affecting that H column or the hundreds column. So let's see, we have a two in there right now. If we did 100 more than 200, that would be, use your brain, let's give some time to think. 300, you're correct. All right, so do we change the other two digits? No, we wouldn't have to because we're asking for something that is just 100 more. We do not need to change the digit in the tens column or the ones column. We are just changing the, the digit within the hundreds column. So let's go ahead and put that up there. Now we have to figure out, I wonder again, what is 100 less? So 100 less, if we've already changed that digit in the hundreds column from a 2 to a 3 with 100 more, what is 100 less than 200? Well, probably. 100. So again, we're just changing that number within that hundreds place. We are not changing anything in the tens or the ones. So if you had guessed that number was going to be 158, you were absolutely correct. Who's up for a challenge? We have another category that we're going to explore. What about 1,000 more? I don't even know where I would start to count 1,000 things. Maybe I'll have to wait to go out after dark and look up at the sky. I'm sure there's probably more than 1,000 stars that we could be watching up at the night sky. How many of you have done that now that you've been home at school, home away from school right now? I've thought about doing this, and this is, seems like a really fun journey to work with with doing numbers. So let's try it. Who's up for it? I thought you would be great. All right, 1,000 more than our number of the day, which was 258. Now, do I have a column for this? I did not have a column for this. But if I did have a column, what would be the next category that it would probably be? Oh, uh, did you say a thousands column? Oh, you would be absolutely correct in that it would have a thousands column over here that we would need to place that number. And since we only said 1,000 more, we would need to put a one in that place value and add in our word or our number of the day, which was 258. So our number would actually be, sorry guys, my number fell down earlier, but it would be 1,258. How many of you guys got that right? 
wow, that was fantastic. You did an absolutely wonderful job with getting that number of the day and running through that routine. But we have one more thing that we're going to be working on. And we're going to go over here to our number of the day where we have done something to it. I wonder what we have done to this number of the day. If you're thinking about, well, I've seen those before. Those are base 10 blocks that I may be using in my classroom. Did you break that number into base 10 notation? Wow, that's a great representation to be able to know your number of the day. So when I'm thinking about these um, this representation with base 10, I notice there's a couple of things that are there. What's the first thing that I notice? Well, some are bigger than the others. I wonder why that is. Well, if it's bigger on one of the categories, it might be because it's actually a bigger number. So when I'm breaking up this flat, as we call it, we know that a flat represents 10 rows with 10 in each row to make 100 of that number. So if I have two of these that have 100 each in them, that would be a total of 200 in my flat. The next thing that I saw was that I saw some rods. The rods each have 10 cubes in them and they are bound together so that they represent 110. I have represented my number that has 50 with, 10, with 5 rods. So let's count those together again. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. 5 rods with 10 each are going to give us 50. The last thing that we notice is that we have some cubes. Those base 10 cubes are each representing our ones. So if I'm looking at this representation, I can tell that I have four ones across the top and four ones across the bottom. How many of you knew that doubles were four and four made an eight? Oh yes, you guys remember that fact very, very well. So let's again go over this base 10 notation of how we did this number 258. We had two flats, which were 200, five rods, which were 10 each or 50, and eight ones. If I was going to write that out into what I call expanded form and make an addition sentence with that, it would be 200 plus 50 plus 8 equals 258. Will you write that addition sentence in your math journal right now? There's one last thing that we want to do. Since we have an addition, sentence that's already going with that, we would like to also make a subtraction sentence. Who thinks that they would have a good subtraction sentence for us to work with that would represent our number of the day, 258? Ooh, I see lots of hands going up. Oh, I have a couple of people who are ready and willing to share. Let's see. Oh. Okay, what did you say? Oh, you said 260 subtract 2 is equal to 258. Why did you choose 260? Oh, you said that that's a friendly number? That you just knew that two more would make... Um, a friendly number of that 260 and that that would be all you would have to take away was two of those in order to get to 258. Wow, that was so genius. Good job. I'm so excited that you guys were there. Well, this is the end of our number of the day. 
And I'm so, so very happy that you were able to join us on this journey today. And I look forward to doing more with you very soon. I do want to let you know that in a few minutes that we are going to be joined by Miss Jamie Jacobson, and she is going to be working with us on some squiggle books. I look forward to seeing you again and doing this number of the day. Thank you for being a part of this journey. Hi, everybody. Want to say uh, good afternoon or good morning, I guess it still is, to our second and third graders. Um, we have just a few minutes left in our hour together. And I know that many of you are at home with younger brothers or sisters, or maybe you're the youngest in your family. And you and your older brothers or sisters or cousins who live in your house or who are staying with you during the school closure um, may be looking for some things to do for each other. Now, this activity is really something that we do for kinder, first, second, and third graders. Um, and a lot of you know about this because when you were in those grades, uh, you may have made one. Um, probably you know what a squiggle book is or a squiggle journal, you might have called them. And so what we're going to do for just a few minutes is talk about how to make one of these and how to use it with your family, with your grown-ups that live in your house, or um, other children, other students that may be in your home during the day while um, the school is being closed. So <clears throat> what we're going to do, we're going to make a couple of, of samples here. You can use a lot of different things to make yourself a journal. And we've showed some of those to you this week. One thing you can do is just use a regular composition notebook if you want to. And then if you want to make the cover your own, you could use construction paper or newspaper, or you could color it yourself, and you could cut it and glue it on and make your own fancy cover for your, for your composition book. Or you could use just like a regular old spiral. Even if it's been used for some other things, you could use it again, and then you could uh, just use this as your, as your journal or your squiggle book. You could also make your own, and there's a couple ways you could do that. Oh, and, and one other kind of pad. Like, if you don't have a spiral, maybe somebody at home has a legal pad like this. Sometimes legal pads are white, but sometimes they're kind of yellow, and so this would work too. But these are already ready-made notebooks that, that you could use. But to make your own, what you would want to do is find some paper. And if you have lined notebook paper at home, that works really well because you can not only draw here, but you can also write. And then your, your writing will be even and not crooked. It'll be on the lines. And that's good practice while you're away from school is to keep working on your handwriting skills and to be working on your writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or poetry, using the lined paper will help you keep your handwriting neat. But if you don't have lined paper, you could also use just plain white paper or plain construction paper, any color, doesn't matter, whatever you got. So I took some notebook paper here, and what I did is I just took two pieces of colored, colored copy paper, construction paper, and I put several pieces of notebook paper inside, and then I just stapled, I think, five times down the side. Now, if you don't have a stapler or staples at home, um, you could use a hole punch, and then you could tie it with um, a piece of string, a piece of yarn, a ribbon, a little piece of um, twine, anything that you could find that would work. Even the little twisty ties that come on uh, bags at the produce aisle at the grocery store, sometimes those twist ties are really helpful to hold things together. So you could put it that way as well. And that's what I did with my demonstration book, my Squiggle Stories book. I'll show you what I've got in there in just a second. But the other way that you could make one is you could take a few pieces of blank white paper. I'm going to make a squiggle journal for this week alone that has enough pages. So I'm using three pieces of paper, and I'm folding them all in half, and that will give me six pages, front and back, that I can use. And I'm going to take one piece of colored paper, and I'm folding these hamburger style. So if you know what hamburger and hot dog is, you'll know which way I'm doing it. This is hamburger style, so it's kind of the short, stout way if I was folding it long and skinny, that would be what? 
Yeah, that would be hot dog. So this is hamburger stop. So I'm going to do that. And then if I have a stapler, which I don't have up here right now, um, but I could staple it or I could punch holes in it and then I could fasten it together. So that's how you make one. Now, what you put in a squiggle book, you could do this for a younger child in your family or you could ask someone older than you to do it for you, is that you put for each day that you're going to write in your squiggle storybook or your squiggle journal, whatever you're going to call it, you're going to ask somebody to make you a squiggle. And it doesn't have to be very large. It can, it can be very small. Uh, it can be round. It can be pointed. It can have lots of um, rays or arms off of it. But it isn't a picture. It's just some sort of a, of a squiggly shape. And they're going to do that for you, or you can do it for yourself. And then it's your job to make a picture out of this, turn it into something. It could be a living thing or not living thing. It could be real or imaginary, doesn't matter. And then once you have drawn it and colored it, and you can color it with crayons or colored pencils or markers, or you can leave it just with pencil. And if you're drawing in pencil, you can al always use your pencil to kind of shade things and color in different things. And depending on how, how hard you press with your pencil, you can control how light or dark your pencil marks are. So if you don't have colors, a pencil will work just fine or a pen would work OK. So you're going to write then, after you've decorated, you're going to write some sort of a story about what you have drawn. And what I used to tell my students is the rule would be at least four sentences. For second and third grade, you should be able to write four sentences, no problem. And I know you can do that. And if you want someone to check your spelling when you're finished, they can do that. But this is for fun and it's for practice. So if you misspell a word, no one is going to grade you and give you a bad grade on anything. So I've got a squiggle up here on the, on the flip chart that I'm going to work with here. So this is a round shape of a squiggle. So this might be something that an older person or a grown-up in your family would make for you on one of your pages. And so when I look at this, I have to think about what could I turn it into. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it into some sort of a monster, I think. My theme this week has been monsters. I've been talking about Star Wars and space things and all kinds of stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna make to my, make my monster. I'm going to show some motion marks because when he's like chomping away at things, that those little lines show motion. And this, I think, I'm going to make this into his tongue. And so then I'm going to color in some of his tongue pieces. And maybe out here, I'm going to make a fly. So she's, she, I think she's a girl monster because she's got really long eyelashes. And she's going to eat a fly. And so then down here I'm, is where I'm going to write my story. So each day, somebody could put something different inside your squiggle storybook or your journal, whatever you want to call it, and you can keep creative writing going all through the school closure. So I want to make sure that you understand why writing is so important. You know, it's one thing to read a book, and it's one thing to have somebody read to you. Those are very important things. But when you write, you're taking what you know about reading and you're practicing it on paper. It's two different skills, but they're both really important to make sure that you are a good reader, a good writer, and that you can communicate with other people. So we want to make sure that you're practicing that during the school closure as often as you can. So you'll be seeing lots of different kinds of ways to do stories and writing all through At Home with APS but we're really hoping that you will share some of those with us as we go through the next few uh, lessons. So I hope you have a really good day. I've enjoyed talking with you. I hope you enjoyed our shows, and we'll see you next time on At Home with APS.